Pump Coast Studios in Oklahoma City. You're watching the Press Row. I'm Jenny Carlson here with Barry Trammell. It's time for our weekly inbox segment. Your email questions, our answers right here on video. Barry, let's get right to it. Let's start out with Larry. Larry says, what is the difference with Thunder Alley and the New Year's Eve crowd of 20 to 30,000 in Bricktown with even more alcohol? Great question, Mary, coming off obviously the heels of what happened Monday night with Thunder Alley, Bricktown, the shooting. What is the difference? Well, this was a great question because I had to think about it for a while, and I think I've got Larry an answer. I think it comes down to geography. In, uh, on first night, New Year's Eve at, at uh, Bricktown, you're talking about thousands and thousands of people, but spread out over six, eight, 10, 12 city blocks, you know, Brick, Bricktown six, eight blocks wide, three or four blocks long. People are spread out. Thunder Alley, everybody's in a one block. They're right there between Robinson and, and Gaylord and right there on Reno and in, in between the two arenas. I mean, I think it's just a, it's just a uh, question of, of combustion and putting that many people in such a small space. I think that has something to do with it. I think also, Thunder Alley, as the playoffs have gone on, has grown to something that not even the, the, the city or the team, I think, was maybe prepared for. You know, when it started out, you saw maybe 2,000. Great crowd, but it, it, it ballooned to, you know, we, we talked to some cops after that game uh, against the Lakers where the shooting occurred, and they thought it might be upwards of 10,000, Barry. And I just don't know if they had the support system in place to manage that crowd. Where you know New Year's Eve, they do. That may be part of it, too, but I agree. I think everybody right there together and then people coming out of the arena, it just made for a really ugly scene, and obviously it played out in the worst possible way on Monday night. Let's go back to the inbox. This one from Mike. Mike says, the Thunder seems to have an affinity for winning close games. I think that's genetic in good teams. It can't be coached or taught. Well, I think Mike is completely wrong. <laughs> what are you talking about? It can't be coached or taught. Don't you know what teams go through? Go back to Ke look at just look at Kevin Durant. Look at Kevin Durant's struggles in the last seconds in close games. Now he can't miss. There was a time he couldn't make. Right. You got to go through rough times. You got to learn how to play. You got to. This is not something you're born with. There is nothing genetic about teams. Now franchises establish cultures, and that's really good. But teams have to learn how to get through certain situations. This Thunder team over the last two and three years has learned how to deal with these situations. I think Scott Brooks made reference to this. I believe it was on Sunday. You know, the fact that you experience these things and you now know, you, you, you build on that, uh, you know, that, that volume of experience. You can draw from it when you go through situations like this. And that's what the Thunder's done. You know, they, they learned something from their first playoff experience against the Lakers, losing in six games against a really great Lakers team. They learned something a year ago, winning series and then having the uh, disappointment in the Western Conference Finals. And all along the way, they learned how to win. And it, it doesn't just turn on and turn off. You have to go through that, experience it, and learn it. And obviously this team is learning it. We, we question whether they could close out games, Barry, and win close games. Now they're, what, 6-0 in the playoffs. Amazing the stuff. Game. Amazing stuff. All right, back to the inbox. This one from Henry. Henry says, do you think Oklahoma sports fans would rather see the Thunder win the NBA championship or OU or OSU win the national championship in football? Hmm, Barry, good yeah, this question. Is a, that's an easy one if you're talking about uh, OU or OSU? The answer is, of course, the Thunder because half the state or something roughly 40, 60, ever how you want to draw the line, don't want to see uh, the other school win the championship. OU wins a national championship and 60% of the people are gaga. 40% want to move away. So uh, everybody's on board the Thunder bandwagon. It's, a, it's an all for one, one for all deal. It's brought both sides of Bedlam together. It's clear that the Thunder trumps individual OU or OSU accomplishments because of that reason. Right. But I, I think this does bring up an interesting question of are we switching from being a football state to more of a basketball state? I'm not sure I'm ready to say that just yet. I mean, this football thing is ingrained decades and decades and generations and generations, but it is different. This is the first time you've seen both sides of the Bedlam fence coming together with one team under one roof. And it, it's so much fun to see. I think people really enjoy that aspect of it. And, yeah, it would be everybody on board with the Thunder winning an NBA championship, unlike that college football championship. All right, lastly from the inbox, this one from Joshua. Joshua asks, Georgia Tech is the new rumor floating with Florida State coming to the Big 12. What are the positives and negatives of Georgia Tech? Barry, it seems like we've talked about 
What college football team haven't we talked about coming to the Big 12? No, we haven't talked about Duke. I don't think Duke's <laughs> coming. Uh, we haven't but, talked about Georgia Tech till right now. Well, that's true. Now, Georgia <laughs> Tech's an interesting one, but there's some good things about Georgia Tech. Um, it's an established name. Uh, big market, biggest Atlanta. market going Atlanta. I mean, it's basically a Houston South. And uh, fabulous academics. You know, we don't talk much about academics, but the Big 12's taking an academic hit with four of its better academic institutions leaving. Uh, Georgia Tech's a wonderful academic institution. So, uh, you know, and, and good pedigree history. Uh, Georgia Tech uh, ha has the name. So there are some good things. Now, the bad side is I don't know how much TV cachet Georgia Tech brings. If you've ever been to Atlanta, Atlanta is a football town. It's not the Falcons, and it's not Georgia Tech. It's the University of Georgia that uh, dominates Atlanta. So I don't know how much uh, excitement the TV networks would have about Georgia Tech. Um, and again, it, it, it creates uh, more uh, geographic questions, although if you bring in Florida State, bringing in Georgia Tech would be good, but I think Georgia Tech would be a solid addition. Yeah, not not bad. I mean, it definitely, if, you're, if we're talking about Louisville, which we have, if we're talking about Cincinnati, which we have, you know, some of those types of teams. I think Georgia Tech's in line with, with those types of teams. You know, maybe right now, um, you know, somebody like a, a Louisville or Cincinnati might be, you know, more exciting. They might have more offense and those sorts of things play better on TV. But Georgia Tech has been a team, a program that has been a power. So it's not like they don't know how to win, how to play exciting football. So I think they're on par with those those sorts of teams. And goodness only knows, Barry, where conference realignment will end. The summer's only begun. We may, we may have 14 teams by the end of the summer in the Big 12. Wait and see. And be sure to stay with the best coverage team anywhere at newsok.com and every day in the Oklahoma.